partners. Thank you for joining us for tonight's gathering. Tonight, we welcome Vice Admiral Vivek Murthy, 21st U.S. Surgeon General, and Rear Admiral Joan Hunter, Senior Advisor to the Surgeon General, to discuss the importance of officership. Thank you to all that submitted questions. These questions were de-identified before being sent to our speakers. The chat function for tonight is live for use to communicate with the COA staff. Our speakers will not be able to see chat messages. We also ask you for one last time, please ensure your microphone is now muted. And now, the importance of officership. Vice Admiral Murthy and Rear Admiral Hunter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kelly. And sir, thank you very much for your time to the COA this evening. And I'm uh, honored and privileged to partner with you this evening to make this successful and informative for our officers in the COA. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you that I have written down that I would like to ask you before we begin the general question and answer session. My first question, if you're willing to go down this route with me, sir, is to ask you, and also obviously to welcome you back as our 21st Surgeon General and from being the 19th Surgeon General. And my question is, you are the first Surgeon General to serve not two non-consecutive terms. What made you want to return again after four years away? Well, thanks Admiral Hunter. And how nice it is to be able to do this with you, this conversation. Um, you know, when we first met uh, years ago, I remember I uh, sort of dragooned you and took you out of <laughs> the National Guard Bureau and asked you to come back and serve the Commission Corps and headquarters uh, by leading our effort there. And we'll always be grateful that you said yes uh, and that you served the Corps so ably. So thank you for what you did. And just so glad to be working together once again. You know, I will say that when I was a Surgeon General last time, that having the opportunity uh, to serve and to get to know the Corps, to be a part of the Corps, was really one of the most gratifying parts of the role. Uh, it was something that, uh, you know, I've you know, certainly kept in my you know, in my memories, uh, it's something that taught me a lot. Uh, and as I met officers around the country, I also just came to understand more deeply um, what was working well about our service, but where we could uh, get stronger, where we could make improvements. And I think the, um, the for me, the, the, I was, I never actually thought I would have a chance to come back to government and serve again. Uh, but, you know, life, sometimes life happens and the universe acts in mysterious ways. And I was given an opportunity to come back by President Biden. And I thought about it. I talked to my wife, Alice, about it. And there were really you know, two big things that, that helped make that decision. One was the fact that our country was in the middle of an extraordinary pandemic that was, um, you know, was with no end in sight. And you know, it was something my family always taught me, my mother and father from when I was a young boy. Uh, and this is something they taught me not through words, but through action, is that when your community is struggling, then it's everybody's responsibility to step up and help. And so I felt I was given an opportunity to step up and help. And I wanted to, I wanted to help, I wanted to do what I could. And so that was an important reason was to help address COVID during a time where our country was in a public health crisis. But the other reason uh, to come back and something that uh, was close to my heart was the opportunity to work with the Commission Corps again. You know, I had really come to just love my experiences with our officers who are just so full of passion and energy and, and vision, um, whose resilience always, um, often surprised me in, in, in very positive ways. But despite dealing with a lot of challenges and having to sometimes work in far from ideal circumstances, they somehow would found it in, within themselves to remain uh, not just committed, but to remain you know, in, in a good mood and cheerful while they were doing it. And um, I still remember going to Liberia, for example, and, working there with our officers during the Ebola mission when they had uh, been there for weeks and weeks without their families, not knowing if they themselves were gonna get sick, but still like the optimism and the, the commitment that I saw like in their faces and heard in their voices, just uh, that, that to me was one of my favorite parts of the Corps, was just having a chance to work with the officers. So having a chance to do that again um, was, uh, was just a, a gift that I, I, you know, I couldn't have imagined that I'd be able to, to enjoy. Uh, so the, all together, that, that's why I came back, you know, and yeah, one thing I learned last time is you, you never take uh, your time for granted, right? Like each day matters. Yeah. 
you just never know how life evolves and how long you'll have. And so this time around, I, I want to make sure that we're using, you know, each day uh, here and every day that I have an office to do something to address the COVID pandemic when most effectively we can, to do something to move our commission core forward. I do think this is a pretty extraordinary time for the commission core. Uh, I think there's a lot we can do, a lot we have to do to serve the nation's health um, and that we can become stronger in the process. But that's ultimately what, uh, what led me back here. And um, I'm just really looking forward to working with our officers over the years ahead. Fantastic, thank you, sir. My next question is something that comes up over and over again and again, quite frankly, with our existing officers, our current officers. And that is that you have not yet selected a deputy surgeon general. And we're all interested in what you think the skills and the traits should be for the ideal deputy surgeon general. Yeah, it's something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, something I thought about a great deal when I was SG last time, and it's what led me ultimately to Admiral Trent Adams, uh, Sylvia Trent Adams, who was the chief nursing officer at, actually at the time. And I was really grateful that she agreed to uh, come and serve as a DSG because she had to step down from the CNO role. But, uh, but what a wonderful leader uh, she was, continues to be, although she's no longer in the core and she's retired. Um, although I think once you're in the core, you're always in the core. <laughs> and so I still call on her for advice. But I will say that experience working with her, thinking deeply about the deputy's role has clarified for me over time what is important uh, to me in that role. And so a few things that uh, that, I, that I'm looking for in the right candidate. And you're right, we, we haven't settled on uh, on someone yet, although we've been actively thinking about it in the office and um, uh, and considering, you know, some different options and paths to go down. Um, but we're hoping uh, that in the, you know, in the relatively near term, we'll be able to make, uh, make an announcement soon. But here's what I'm looking for. So one is uh, just integrity, like above everything, like I, I've just realized that knowing that the person you can trust is of the highest personal integrity is, is just so important uh, to building a working relationship. And also just to knowing that, that um, whatever may come, that that person is going to be able to get, you know, just going to show up fully, is going to be uh, open and honest with you, level with you about what's working, but also what's not working. That was something I, I remember telling Dad, well, Trent Adams also, in the beginning, I was like, I don't want you to just tell me what I want to hear or tell me when things are going well. I especially need you to tell me when things aren't going well. And when there's something I may be missing or something I need to do differently or something that we as a core need to do fundamentally differently because uh, those are the most important moments. So that integrity is really important. The second piece is courage. You know, to be able to speak the truth is not easy. Uh, to do it in difficult times and their consequences is even harder. Uh, but that takes courage. And that's something that's also important. You know, the third thing I'm looking for is somebody who is like aligned in their vision for what the core can be. And, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as the conversation goes on, but, but I do have a vision for what I think the core can be uh, over the coming years. What I hope we can build as a foundation for the core over the next several decades. And I want somebody who's not uh, just interested in keeping the trains running and keeping us exactly where we are, but somebody who recognizes that we have a window of opportunity here to build the core into something bigger uh, that can have an even greater impact on the nation's health. And I don't mean bigger, by the way, just in terms of the number of officers, I mean bigger in terms of impact, in terms of the strength of the core and the, the range of its influence. Um, so I want someone who's really aligned in, in vision and who wants to pursue uh, that bold pathway for the core, which is not easy, we'll take risk. It's always easy to stay where you are than to, 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 you know, to grow and to you know, expand in different ways, which sometimes takes breaking glass, but that's gonna be important. You know, and the last few things that are important to me is, is somebody who can really communicate well uh, with the core. Uh, one of the things that uh, for me is, um, you know, sort of more sensitive to is just the notion of how communication affects organizations. And I think so many of the challenges we face uh, in general in organizations, not just the core, but organizations anywhere, uh, are have to do with communicate can be traced back to communication challenges. Um, when communication is poor, that breeds mistrust. You know, it makes people feel like things aren't transparent. It leads to misunderstanding. Uh, but being able to build like the, the core into you know a, a powerful, strong future vision means 
that's not just a job of a few people in headquarters or in the immediate office of the Surgeon General. We got to bring the entire court with us, right? We have to get input from the, our officers. We have to make sure we're all rowing in the same direction. That's going to take, uh, you know, DSG who can really communicate and communicate well. Um, and execution is, is a key part of that too, right? Like there are, there are plenty of leaders who can, who can dream up visions and can put plans on paper, but executing those plans is a critical part of leadership. Uh, so I'm looking for somebody who's seasoned uh, at not just developing plans, but at executing them uh, at different levels uh, within uh, government and working across government, recognizing that we have to engage uh, not only the Department of Health and Human Services, but build the right relationships with people across the administration, with folks in Congress to ultimately uh, get the job done. The last thing, uh, Admiral Hunter, is culture. You know, every organization uh, rises or falls based on how strong its culture is. It's not that culture is the only thing that's important, but without it, very little else can work. And so I'm also looking for a DSG who understands the importance of culture and who has had the experience of shaping culture in the organizations that he or she has been in uh, in the past, because we have a lot that's right about the culture of the core, and we've got to build on that. Uh, we have some, some things that, that we could make better, like we would make stronger. And I think communication is a piece of that, piece of that culture. We want a culture, uh, my view is that we want a culture that feels uh, transparent, uh, a culture that feels uh, compassionate, like we care about, about our officers and it's reflected in everything we do and say. Uh, and I think we also want a culture of accountability where we, we when we say uh, things, we mean them and we hold ourselves uh, to account in getting them done, but we also uh, hold others uh, to that same standard and same account. So I've said, I listed a lot of qualities, which is why it's taking time, you know, to find uh, the, the right person. But I think that it's worth taking that time because with the right deputy surgeon general, I do believe that we can do a great deal uh, as a core and and make that broader vision that, that has been on my mind for the Commission Corps of Reality. Thank you, sir. We look forward to that selection. Next question. We've had a challenging year, as you well know, sir, with large deployments. And unfortunately, as you and Admiral Orsega pointed out in our town hall last week, we need to normalize our promotion rates and the force distribution in the core. And I wanted to see, or to ask you specifically, how do you recommend that we keep our morale high now and to stay focused on growing as officers? It's such an important question. Let me just say that this, this whole experience uh, with the, this last promotion cycle, uh, and this is a very difficult one and a very painful one for for our officers. And I've recognized that, I've, I've certainly heard that. Um, unfortunately, you know, late in the process, there were certain things that happened, which I will explain actually, that made this pathway a difficult one to avoid the reduction in, in promotion rates. But to be that as it may, and even though I hope all of you, all those who under, you know, came to the town hall uh, heard the, the extended explanation that uh, Admiral Orsega walked through uh, of why the promotion rates uh, uh, were reduced uh, this year. And he also walked through what the future will look like. Um, but with that said, it was still painful. And I've you know, spoke to officers and met with them in New Mexico, I've spoke, met, you know, heard from officers from many parts of the country uh, who expressed just how difficult this was. So I just first want to acknowledge that. I know that this was, this was tough. And then for many people, this came out of the blue. Uh, there wasn't a lot of advance, any advance notice. Uh, so officers' expectations were not uh, you know, I, you know, in, in the right place here. And, uh, and that wasn't their fault. It's that they just didn't know because because uh, the, they weren't told that. Uh, so with all of that said, uh, let me uh, just walk you through a little bit of what uh, what happened in terms of uh, what drove uh, that decision. Um, many of you are aware that there is statute, um, 42 USC 207D, since it's like burned in my head now. Um, but there's statute that demands that the secretary uh, determine the force distribution of the core, uh, you know, from uh, not for our flag ranks, obviously, but for uh, all the way up to our 06 ranks. And what is, what is true is that the Commission Corps has actually been out of compliance with the rates, uh, you know, that statute dictates uh, and has been out of compliance actually for a while. Um, and not my, by a little bit, but actually by a lot. And particularly when it comes to our 04, 05, and 06 ranks. 
Now, for that reason, starting in 2016, there were efforts made to actually reduce the rates, the promotion rates, uh, a little bit each year. And that process happened 2016, 2017, 2018, uh, continued to happen. But what also happened is that when the promotions for 2021 uh, were submitted uh, to the Office of General Counsel and to, to the department, uh, there was significant concern at the degree to which the rates still, or the promotion levels still remained uh, out of compliance. Now, you might think, well, if the statute says the secretary determines the rate, then why don't we just ask the secretary to change the rate? Well, the, here's why. Yeah, because it turns out in addition to the secretary, OMB uh, over the years uh, had actually expressed clearly that we needed to more closely match uh, other uniform services and have a bell curve distribution uh, in our ranks, which we did not have. Uh, and related to that, uh, the target rates uh, are actually tied uh, to our funding and failure to comply would have resulted in a misalignment of our poor force and our funding. And for those reasons and taking all that into consideration, uh, the reason OGC made the, uh, the, the strong decision it did uh, in saying that the compliance had to actually come into effect much faster was that they didn't feel, and I think we can assume that the secretary couldn't in good conscience sign a new distribution uh, given again, how out of compliance we were and given OMB's direction. Now, putting all of that together, that meant that we were forced uh, to take significant action to reduce the promotion rates. What we did is you know, explore as many options as we could to see how can we reduce uh, the blow of that? Because to get into compliance in a single year um, would have been extraordinarily difficult. You effectively would have had to drop promotion rates to near zero. And even though they dropped significantly, uh, what we did is we uh, proposed and, and, and asked for an extension uh, effectively over, over seven years where we could ultimately get into compliance, which would allow for a smaller reduction each year than otherwise would happen if you had to get into compliance uh, in short order. So I'm sharing a lot here only because I know that this has uh, been on the minds uh, of many officers, understandably so. Uh, a few other things I just want to, to mention as well, since they were questions that came up uh, during the town hall as well. Um, and this is a little bit about what other uh, factors impact our promotion rates. Well, one of the things that affects in our accessions, right? If we add more uh, officers to the, the commission core, we recruit more officers, that impacts our rate because our promotion rates are based again on the overall distribution of officers. And if we're adding more officers at O2 and O3 levels, then that gives us the opportunity <laughs> Uh, to promote more officers at, at higher levels. So it will positively, you know, sort of affect our rates uh, at those levels. The other factor that affects uh, our promotion rates year to year are retirements. And one of the recommendations that Admiral Orsega has, has made to me is that we reevaluate our retirement policies. Um, and so that is something that we will also uh, look to do. Um, with all that said, though, there are other efforts that uh, you know, I've spoken with Admiral Orsega about uh, at headquarters uh, and that she is taking with the team there and with the uh, advice and support of Admiral Hunter uh, to modernize uh, the promotion process. And this is a, an important one for me because one of the things that I heard about from officers, not just this time, uh, but in my prior stint as Surgeon General were concerns about the promotion process. Uh, I heard requests for greater understanding and clarity about how it works concerns around discrepancies, geographic and otherwise in promotion rates, uh, concerns about lack of transparency in process or communication uh, about the process. And to me, like, this is coming often enough that it's a clear signal that we need to make changes in our promotion system and reevaluate it. So while the process changes will take place, there are also some uh, technical changes that are in the work. Uh, one example of this is the newly released officer package promotion verification system. And it's a system that will basically allow officers to have full visibility of their promotion packet with the, with the real goal of reducing future issues of missing documents and things of that sort. Um, we're also working with officers, uh, or I should say Adam Orsega and her team are doing this work of working with officers from all categories to enhance the objective promotion scoring tools uh, that can be used by promotion board members. 
uh, and also uh, by officers uh, for feedback during the review process. And we're also, and this is not a new thing, uh, it's been discussed before, but uh, we'll also be exploring the one rank promotion system to better align with our sister services. Um, and finally, the, there are more things happening, but the last thing I'll mention is that just around the CV, uh, which is to assist board members in evaluating your you know, officers packets to make it more consistent. Uh, we're gonna introduce uh, one curriculum uh, vitae for all 11 categories. Uh, and that single CV will support uh, our officers in presenting their data in a standardized format uh, for evaluation. So again, there's more to come here, um, but the bottom line is it was a very difficult position constrained in part by the statute and by OMB direction uh, that led to this reduction in rates. But the, the what I don't want people to take away from here is that somehow the rates dropped to zero. They did not. And in the uh, in the town hall, Admiral Orsega, in fact, went through uh, the rates, uh, you know, a few years ago, the rates this year, and and what we think the rates may be, you know, over the, the next few years, again, with a caveat that accessions and retirements will affect uh, those rates and could affect them actually positively. Um, so with all that said, uh, you know, still more, we've got to keep communicating about these promotions. I know that this was uh, disappointing to many people. Um, and we hope to get back to balance, you know, over, over the coming years uh, in a gradual and thoughtful way, uh, while continuing to promote as many people as we can uh, and support our officers with a better promotion process uh, over the next few years. Admiral Hunter, I, I'm going to actually turn to you for a second because I know you know you've served as a director of headquarters. You've been involved in the promotion process as well. But I'd like to ask, you know, from your perspective, uh, anything you would add on the on the promotions this year? Any any wisdom from your experience? Well, sir, thank you very much. Um, I do think that both you and Admiral Orsega have done a tremendous job in taking this information that none of us expected to happen and really doing a deeper dive, my words, into why this has happened and what the minimum, minimum impact will be to our service members. This is an important issue for them. They have families, they give their best in their positions as core officers. And so whatever we can do to promote the good and hard work that our officers do will be very much appreciated by them. And I know because I am seeing behind the scenes on the work that you were doing and the work that Admiral Arcega is doing, that you are working very hard to minimize the movement that we have to make in order to comply with the law. So thank you for that, sir. No, I, I appreciate that. I mean, it's the least we can do because I mean, the, the painful part about this was that, you know, this came, uh, you know, at, at, the, at a very difficult time. Our officers have completed 4,500 plus deployments for COVID-19 uh, over the last year and a half, more than 600 deployments for the UC mission. And that's not counting uh, additional intra-agency deployments and other deployments not related to COVID-19 and to the UC mission. We know officers, and I've talked to officers who have deployed multiple times, you know, and you've canceled family vacations, who have, uh, you know, just really given it their all during this extraordinarily, extraordinarily difficult year and a half. And so this news on top of that, I know for some officers was just extraordinarily difficult. Um, but that's why I just want to reassure you that we, we hear that, you know, if we could have avoided this, uh, we would have, uh, but this is really something dictated by statute OMB and, and, and something the department needed to, to make happen. We'll continue to look for ways uh, to, to improve things in the promotion process to support our officers uh, during this transition to set up uh, some additional communication channels so that we don't go another year without talking about promotions, but we keep an open channel to update you on developments. Um, but you know, we're, we're all trying to make uh, the most out of a situation that has been very difficult, I know, for our, all of our officers. Thank you, sir. And and Hunter, my, yeah, one other thing me, just to, to ask you as, as well, uh, if I could, um, you know, you asked me uh, about the DSG role. Uh, I alluded to earlier with everyone that I brought you in uh, to serve as a head of headquarters uh, while you were at the National Guard Bureau. But I was curious if you could tell uh, us a little bit about, um, about why you actually decided to come back uh, to headquarters uh, when I asked. And as you think about 
the DSG role. You've seen a number of DSGs over the years in the core. What stands out to you as important, both in qualities and, uh, and who are the people you remember uh, as DSGs that made a real impact on the core? Well, I'll tell you, sir, thank you. I, I, I think that's an important question and I think it's important for our officers to hear how important you take the Deputy Surgeon General role uh, the Department of Defense looks as, at their deputies as almost an alter ego and who can fill in, can lead, can take the operational responsibilities for the Corps. So that's similar to what they do in the other services as well. And then allow you to be the nation's doctor. That's historically been the role of the Deputy Surgeon General. So I have learned not only in the last seven Surgeons General, not including the acting that I've worked for, that their deputies did have some common denominators, as well as those that I worked with in the Department of Defense. And the traits that I saw admired were agility, adaptability, flexibility, resilience, and character character made all the difference in the world to me because I would sit in very high level meetings in the Pentagon and I could really tell the difference between a general officer who was prepared that had that character. And so there was always a fundamental responsibility that you could tell these gentlemen and women had and it was ethics and values. And it was integrity, as you mentioned as well. So I think the ability to communicate is very important. You've mentioned that, but problem solving and agility and flexibility, especially at a time of change where the core is right now, uh, I think is important. So thank you. I appreciate the ability to weigh in on that, sir. Thank you, Admiral Hunter, for that. I appreciate that. Um, and one other thing I wanted to ask you, just there's, I know that many officers have asked about is, um, is the ready reserve. Uh, and if I can add our strike teams as well. You know, one, one of the things that's really important is the deployability uh, for the core. And we know that the ready reserve and the strike teams are uh, poised to significantly expand the deployability and impact of the core. Uh, I'd love it if you could sh uh, speak a little bit since you are uh, you've been helping to lead these efforts actually for several years now, and we've made great progress, but can you share a little bit with our officers about, about that progress and your vision for uh, the reserve and the strike teams? Absolutely, sir. I think it's important for those that are listening on the call today to realize that the Ready Reserve really broadens the scope of the Commission Corps, and it's important for our officers and our retired officers to know that our ready reserve will augment the active duty service and they will provide a much needed manpower for our underserved populations, which is a priority for the public health service, as you well know. What it is not, it is not a replacement for active duty and it is not a replacement for those active duty regular Corps officers who are going to be deploying and have deployed and will deploy in the future for us. These reservists we're looking at are clinical skills experts, something that quite frankly, we've learned over the last two or three years that the core really needs more support in. So we need those individuals who have those skill sets that will be better deployers based on what the mission assignments are. And so we think our reservists are going to be able to fill some of those gaps, but never will they replace regular Corps officers. And I think that's important for those that are on the call and for those retirees that are on the call to hear as well. The COA I want to also mention, sir, back in 2018 and 2019, when some senior government leaders were questioning the value of the Commission Corps. It was the COA who stood with us when that was happening. And I think it's important to recognize that we appreciate, or I certainly appreciate what they did for us. And it's those critical conversations that happen with government leaders who do support the Corps 
that really made a difference. And I just want to thank the COA for that. And that modernization effort or the modernization effort that we are now currently in the middle of is part of the COA's advocacy for the poor and our leaders within the Department of Health and Human Services that quite frankly, allow us to continue to modernize our core. And the Ready Reserve was part of that modernization. It was one of the key requirements, quite frankly, of where we needed to go as a service. So that's pretty much where we are. The value of our core is undeniable. You've already said it, sir. And as we move forward in this modernization effort, we will become stronger. We will get on the other side of this and we will be a much more agile, deployable force and we will continue to serve our country. So thank you, sir. So I couldn't agree more, Admiral Hunter. And I think, um, I mean, uh, let me say a word also about what that future could look like. Because I, when I think about the you know, vision for the core, I think what we could be, uh, you know, to me, this is a really interesting window of opportunity that we have. Uh, you know, sometimes born out of crisis uh, become the opportunities to grow and develop and fill important roles. And I think unlike perhaps any crisis we've lived uh, through in our lifetimes, this COVID-19 pandemic has really highlighted for the country, not just what our acute public health needs are, but about the importance of preparation for the future and investing in good public health systems. And I think the Commission Corps has an opportunity to be, uh, you know, an incredibly important part of that. Uh, and that means investing in the core to, to build its foundation, to be more deployable, to be uh, you know, able to respond to multiple public health needs at once. Uh, and that means that uh, the, the reserve and the strike team actually become very important. When I think about like my, my personal priorities for the core, uh, they fall into these buckets. Number one, I wanna make sure that we are strengthening uh, the morale and the well-being uh, of our officers. And that means taking a look very broadly at what contributes uh, to well-being of officers, whether it's you know, how we communicate with them, whether it's how we, whether it's things related to promotions, whether it's deployments, like there are many factors that go into uh, an officer's overall well-being. I want us to be able to think about that, uh, to understand from officers directly uh, what we can and should be doing, and then just start taking steps uh, toward improving that well-being. And that also means taking care of our officers when they engage in difficult, stressful situations. Uh, we know that these deployments come with uh, at a cost, and not just a monetary cost, but at a psychological cost. Uh, and part of the responsibility of the Commission Corps is not just to serve the nation, but to serve its officers and to be there to support them when they come back from deployment, if they run into difficulty during deployments. I want us to be able to be that consistently, you know, at scale for all the officers who need uh, support. The second priority, in addition to well-being and morale, has to do with deployability. And we've touched on this, uh, but in my mind, to be able to achieve that vision of being the flexible, deployable force that the country needs, a force that can deploy at speed and scale, we need uh, to have certain changes made. We need to build up the reserve. We need to build it, the strike team. We need to take a closer look at how we manage our mission critical lists. We need to more equitably distribute uh, our deployments so that we're not taxing a small group of people again and again uh, with the deployment requests. These are all the things that we need to do to be able to deploy at scale and at speed. And then the third priority for me is infrastructure within the core. So often our limitations come from not having uh, sufficient systems and, and processes and funding in place to really support the kind of headquarters that the Commission Corps needs. Uh, we know that until recent years, uh, we barely had any money for training, uh, which you know seems, it seems like it would be unthinkable. Uh, and I remember coming into the Corps as Surgeon General in 2014 and just being so puzzled when I was told there's no money in the budget to train our officers. And I said, how could that be? And people like Admiral Hunter and others were trying to figure out creative ways to build partnerships with the National Guard Bureau and others to provide that training. But better resourcing, better infrastructure of the core means that we will be better trained, that we will be better, more efficient uh, in our systems and processes, and we're able to then execute uh, on our mission. 
So these are the three areas where I really want to focus uh, during my time as Surgeon General in terms of the Commission Corps. Uh, I will say also on the uh, on the uh, sort of other side of the house, if you will, uh, the nation's doctor side of the house, there are public health priorities for the country that are also uh, on our on our list. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously chief among those, given the crisis that we are in, but there are related priorities also where I want to focus. Last time when I was Surgeon General, the, the opioid crisis and addiction more broadly was a key focus for us. Uh, the rising uh, unfortunately, rising e-cigarette, uh, you know, issue was also a focus area. Uh, but this time around, we have a desire to continue focusing on substance use disorders because they've worsened during the pandemic. Uh, a big area of focus for me also will be mental health, uh, given that not only has that gotten worse during the pandemic for many people, uh, particularly and in including our children, but we've struggled with mental health concerns long before COVID-19 came. Uh, with insufficient investment as a country in prevention programs, but still disjointed and, uh, and fractured treatment system, which isn't accessible to enough people. And of course, with the cultural challenge of stigma around COVID, around mental uh, health that still prevents people fundamentally from even talking about it or coming forward to get help. So these are all areas where um, we can focus and want to focus, uh, you know, at the public health side of the house. I would lastly say related uh, to mental health and the pandemic are two uh, sub areas of focus, which will likely grow out into their own full fledged areas. But one of them is clinician well being. And th th this is a, an issue I've been concerned about for years, but looking at the burnout rates among nurses and doctors and other members of the healthcare professions. We, I was alarmed before the pandemic, but we've seen those numbers actually worsen during the pandemic as well. Not surprisingly, uh, many uh, people listening today, many of our officers and retired officers are part of that healthcare workforce uh, that have been on the front lines and helped respond to COVID-19. And you know firsthand better than anyone how taxing that can be. But to be able to have to do it again and again and again for 18 months uh, and counting, that, that's an extraordinary task and challenge and burden uh, for many healthcare providers. So it's not a surprise that we're seeing uh, rates of depression, anxiety, PTSD, and suicidal ideation on the rise. So addressing clinician well-being with a national agenda, with a plan that not only engages government uh, more systematically in that process, but also uh, hospital systems and payers and other parts of the healthcare system, that's a really important priority. And the last one I'll just mention for you is this. It, it's, it has to do with how we think about the post-pandemic uh, society that we want to live in. If we do nothing differently, our country will likely just snap back to 2019 uh, once this pandemic is over. And you might say, well, what's wrong with 2019? That seems pretty good, especially in comparison to what's happening now in the country. Um, the problem isn't with 2019, it's that it's with the question of, could we actually do better than 2019? Are there things that we've learned during this pandemic about how we want to live our lives, about how we wanna work, about how we wanna make decisions about the time we spend with family, about how we design our schools and workplaces to support relationships and give people the flexibility to be with their families? Are there lessons that we've learned that we need to capture and implement as we design intentionally a post-pandemic society. One of my worries is if we don't have this conversation, then all of the opportunity for reflection and change will slip away and we will just go down the path of least resistance, which is to go back to the exact way things were. But our office, the Office of the Surgeon General, I believe can play an important role in seeding and jumpstarting that conversation about what the world looks like or should look like or could look like post-pandemic. And we're, we may start that with a specific sector like uh, employers and employees looking at workplace design and how that could be uh, different in ways that better support families. Uh, we may look at it with schools and we also just may look at it on a family level as we all try to figure out uh, perhaps in our personal life how we want to make decisions differently. But here's the reason we're doing it. Because if we make intentional decisions about how to live our life post pandemic, we can actually create, I believe, uh, a society with institutions and with personal practices that actually supports well being much more effectively than what we were doing before. Because many of us, myself included, I put myself in this bucket, we built our life entirely around work, right? And we fit family in where there is an opportunity to do so. Uh, I'm not, that is not, I don't believe, the the recipe for a life of true happiness and fulfillment. 
Um, when I, you know, as a clinician was taking care of patients over the years, I still remember the conversations I had with patients at the end of their life, when I had the privilege of listening to their final reflections in those final days and hours. And, you know, nobody talked about how much time they spent at work. Nobody talked about the promotions they got, about the corner office that they were awarded, about what was on their resume, about how much was in their bank account. What people talked about at the end of life were their relationships, the people they love deeply, people they wish they had spent more time with, people who had broken their hearts. It becomes so clear at the end of life that it is our relationships that truly matter when it comes to our happiness and our well-being, and by extension to our health. But that isn't a lesson that we have to wait till the end of life to, to learn and to incorporate in the design of our lives or of our society. And that's the purpose of jumpstarting those conversations about the design of a post-pandemic life. It's what I want our office to do. Uh, it's what we've heard of great enthusiasm from partners in the community and joining us in, in having that broader conversation. And interestingly, that will actually help build a foundation for the work that we do on mental health as well. So I shared a lot because there's a lot of priorities you know, that we have for the Commission Corps and for the country as a whole. But this is why I'm, you know, I'm excited to think about what we can do uh, in the, the time ahead with our officers, uh, with COA, with other partners uh, in the community, because this has got to be a uh, this has got to be a, an all of the above response, as I think of it, an all in response. Um, this is not something that a few people in the immediate office of Surgeon General are going to do alone, but this is something we've got to do together. Thank I'll you, turn it back to you, Monitor. Thank you very much. I just have one quick final question for you. Uh, last week, you released your first Surgeon General advisory on misinformation as the 21st Surgeon General, just four months after swearing in. What motivated you to focus on this topic and what do you suggest our officers do that we might do to impact this in a positive way? Well, thanks for asking about that, Emma Hunter. The Surgeon General's advisory that we issued on Thursday was on health misinformation. And we issued it for a few reasons, but most importantly, because health misinformation harms our health. And what is health misinformation? It's information that's false, that's inaccurate or misleading, according to the best evidence that we have at the time. Now, we've seen up close how misinformation has impacted the COVID effort. There are about two thirds of people who are unvaccinated who either believe common myths about the COVID vaccine or think those myths might be true. Myths like you can get COVID from the vaccine. Absolutely not true in case anyone wasn't sure about that. But there are other myths like that, very common ones that people have bought into because they read it online or a friend posts it uh, on social media. And so we've seen the impact of misinformation. Now, misinformation is not new. It's been around for a while. But what is new is the speed, scale, and sophistication with which it's spreading. Uh, and that's why uh, it, was, it was an alarming uh, phenomenon that we were seeing. And we issued the advisory not only to call attention to it, but to draw the country uh, you know, into action, really to call people uh, to action. And that's why we actually laid out multiple sectors uh, that we were asking uh, to step up. You know, One of them actually were individuals themselves because each time we share something on social media, each time we call up a friend and say, hey, I just saw this crazy article, you wouldn't believe uh, what I just read. And then we tell them about it. We are sharing information. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, is it information or is it misinformation? Sometimes it's hard to tell. So we're asking people to stop and check the sources for what they share. Is it coming from a scientific credible source? And if it's not, or if you're not sure, then don't share. That's a powerful way we can actually start to slow the spread of misinformation. But one of the other sectors I laid out, and, and there were many, we, we called upon healthcare providers, educators, we laid out roles for government, we called on researchers to help deepen our understanding of how misinformation spreads, who it's predominantly affecting and how to counter it. But technology companies were an important uh, sector also uh, that we a call to action. And here we know that so much of this spread is happening on social media sites and other tech platforms. And so we laid out a number of actions that they could take to provide greater transparency about the flow of this misinformation, data on what is actually, what they're doing that's actually working and what's not working. Um, we also asked them to take action to change their algorithms, recognizing that the algorithms on this site often end up serving up 
more and more misinformation to you once you consume one bit of it, which actually deepens a problem instead of solving it. So that's what the advisory was about. We are grateful that in launching it, it did receive, um, it, did, it was well received uh, overall and, uh, and has generated a lot of conversation already with technology companies and with other stakeholders. Uh, so we plan to continue the momentum there. But for all of those uh, out there who may uh, be interested in helping, you can certainly find uh, you know, our report online. If you just search for uh, Surgeon General Advisory Misinformation, it will come right up. Uh, you can find it on our website as well. And the, you, the very most basic thing you can do is to lead by example in what you share. I suspect many of you do that, but talking to your family and friends also, uh, when you see them sharing misinformation, advising them also uh, to, again, not share if they're not sure about sources is important. Obviously you wanna do that kindly, you wanna do that respectfully, but many people don't realize that they're sharing misinformation. And I think many of them would appreciate knowing from somebody they actually cared about like a family member or friend because most people aren't sharing because they want to harm their friends. They're sharing because they see something alarming and they think, gosh, maybe it'll help if I, if I post this. Um, so simply by reaching out to your networks and talking to them, you can make a big difference. And if you are uh, you know, an officer who uh, you know, is interested in talking to the community, I will tell you, you can make a huge difference there. Because if you call up almost any school in the country and you say, I'm a PHS officer and uh, you know, I know a lot about COVID and I understand you may have people with questions about the vaccine. Would you like me to speak to parents at your school, to teachers at your school, to do a virtual town hall? Um, my guess is you'd get a lot of takers uh, because there's a lot of confusion around these vaccines uh, in schools and among parents. Uh, there's also, I think, uh, other organizations, YMCAs and others in your community that would welcome welcome the opportunity to have somebody come and talk to their community about COVID-19 as with many faith organizations. So that's the second ask I would make is that by reaching out even to the organizations in your network, your child's school, uh, your faith organization, the YMCA that may be near you, uh, you can offer an extraordinarily valuable resource, which is information, accurate information on COVID-19. And that will help to dispel some of the misinformation that's out there conversation by conversation. Thank you, sir. I'm now going to turn it over to Commander Purdy who has questions from the Commissioned Officers Association and some of its members. Yes, good evening. Thank you Vice Admiral Murphy and Rear Admiral Hunter for your willingness to take time out of your schedule and address COA's membership this evening. I'm Commander Christy Purdy, Chair Elect for the COA Board of Directors. Over the past several weeks, COA has received a large number of questions in preparation for tonight's presentation. Vice Admiral Murphy and Rear Admiral Hunter have graciously agreed to allow time in tonight's schedule to address a few of the questions that are on the minds of our members. By and large, the majority of the questions received by COA surrounded the topics of promotion, morale and support, officership, vision and strategic plan and parity with our sister services. As we hope our members understand, we have a short amount of time this evening and will not have time to ask all of the questions submitted. But please know, COA submitted each of your de-identified questions to the Office of the Surgeon General for their awareness. Thank you Vice Admiral Murphy and Rear Admiral Hunter for providing remarks to some of the questions submitted throughout your presentation this evening. On behalf of our members, we'll move to our first question. Sir, how can officers prepare themselves for the current and future change in leadership and priorities during the modernization efforts? Hmm. Well, it's a great question. And, and I really do believe that each PHS officer brings a unique professional and personal perspective to the service, which is one of the things that I loved about the Commission Corps during my first time uh, as Surgeon General. Uh, look, here's what I think is going to be really important um, and not just something officers can do to prepare themselves, but to actually help contribute more so to the core. What we really need and one of my priorities, uh, you know, for the core is to think about leadership development. How do we build a cadre of leaders in the core? We already have so many wonderful leaders, but how do we keep building that pipeline so that we have more and more officers who can not only serve the Commission Corps itself, but during deployments can serve to lead other forces, volunteer forces and other civilian uh, assets who often are part of our response. We're seeing that in the UC response right now. 
And so I think for officers to seek out like leadership opportunities where they are developing strategy, where they are bringing people together to take on big challenges, when they're helping shape culture, where they're implementing strategic plans and building their experience with that, that will be invaluable because those are the kind of skills and assets that we can always use more of at headquarters that can help strengthen the core. They're certainly invaluable during deployments as well. I'll tell you something that's happening even near the UC mission right now. What we are seeing increasingly are more asks uh, on the unaccompanied children mission for officers to serve in leadership positions because the people running uh, the, the Operation Artemis have recognized that many of our officers have done really well in those positions. Now that is wonderful for the UC response, but I want you to imagine for a moment that we've got three UC responses happening at the same time and a pandemic brewing. That's a reality, something like that could happen in the future. The question is, do we have enough officers with the requisite experience, leadership experience, to be able to really run teams in the middle of a crisis? Um, I, want to, I want to make sure that the answer to that is an absolute uh, resounding yes. But that means that each of our officers have to think about how to seek out that experience like in your day-to-day -day professional work. Um, the other thing that I would say is that you know, in, the, in the weeks and months ahead, we are going to need your input uh, to figure out how to strengthen pieces of the core, but also how to prioritize what we strengthen. And uh, for me personally, what is gonna matter in those prioritization decisions is what our officers think, what their pain points are. I wanna make sure we're solving them. Uh, one of the reasons, in fact, when I was in the last time we got rid of the fax machine was because I, it might seem like a small thing, you know, but I kept hearing from officers again and again and again that they were had, like waking up at like one in the morning to go and fax documents in for uh, their personnel files. And uh, they had to go at you know odd hours because that's when the machine wouldn't be used and it wouldn't be jammed. And I just kept hearing this. And I was like, this is terrible. Like our officers should not be having to do that. Like this is like the 21st century and we need to get rid of that machine. Uh, and so developing the electronic you know officer uh, personnel file was an important part of that process, trying to give people ways to upload things just again in the modern way. And then again, that seems like a very small thing, but for me, that was a way that we uh, were responsive to what we were hearing from officers. So we are gonna be setting up more ways for you to actually give feedback uh, and setting up a feedback loop so that you know that that feedback is actually being heard and listened to. And I want people to prepare themselves to share feedback. That's gonna be incredibly important to us. I'll just share by example, the, as many of you, over 5,000 of our officers just filled out uh, a deployment survey uh, that we sent out, uh, which was developed by Admiral Childs, who's a commander of our, our uh, Operation Artemis, our UC mission response, uh, you know, with the support of Admiral Orsega. And in those 5,000 responses we got, where we asked people for their preferences on deployments, we have actually now been using that for all of the subsequent deployments that we're doing for the UC mission. Right, so that is gives us a way to actually respect officers' preferences, vacation schedules, and we now need to think about how to use that data for non-UC deployments as well. Uh, but the point is that that feedback is invaluable, and I was encouraged by the response rate. But we really want officers to continue to provide that kind of input because uh, we're going to be asking for more of it uh, in the in the days and the weeks ahead. Um, so anyway, those are just a couple of things um, that that I would say. That the last thing that I would just Add is something that those of you who, are, you know, I connected with during my the last tour of duty will remember because I said it then too, was I really believe it's important for our officers to develop good public communication skills. Now, when I think about the challenge we have with misinformation, the problem is that the voice of credible sources like all of you are drowned out by the other voices of misinformation. But we've got to take control of that information flow again. And the way we do it is by making sure we know how to communicate well, that we're skilled in it, and by taking our voice out into the community directly and not waiting for the community to come to us. And I, when I talked to officers last time, I know there were a number of officers who said to me, well, you know, I don't know how comfortable I feel sort of speaking in public or engaging in that kind of communication. But I think increasingly it's going to be an important asset to serve the public health of the nation because we need people who can communicate when they go on deployments, in between deployments, to be able to speak to schools, to, to churches and, and synagogues, to uh, people in workplaces, to the media. These are all important skills. And I want us to have a cadre of officers who feel comfortable doing that. Not necessarily, I'm not saying that everyone needs to go on 
you know, on pick your news channel and give a national interview. I'm not saying that, but I, the more people that folks feel comfortable talking to, even if it's small groups uh, in small settings, uh, the more powerful we will be as a service and our ability to impact public health. Thank you, sir. Um, I'll ask one final question. In your opinion, what changes related to parity, policy, or systems would be helpful for COA to champion on behalf of PHS officers? Well, that's a kind of you to ask. And, you know, while the Commission Corps can't direct organizations, you know, uh, on the outside and what they do, I can tell you that, you know, areas where we are, are going to work hard to build support uh, are in the, the relation number one, the reserve and the strike teams, because these are extraordinarily important investments for our officers. Uh, number two, in training, to make sure our officers have the tools and skills they need to feel comfortable and to be effective. Uh, out in the field. But we also want to invest more in infrastructure and specifically what I think of as well-being infrastructure. I want to have a, you know, a cadre, a team uh, that provides the psychological support and other support that our, team, our officers need when they go out on deployments and when they come back. Um, you know, we have thankfully set up the core care model, but we need to expand it. We need to make it bigger. Um, we've got to do more uh, for our officers. And and I want us to be able to get the resources to, uh, to support that, those kind of services uh, for our officers. So those are just a few things uh, that, that I think are extraordinarily important in terms of areas of investment, where we've got to make the case uh, to uh, folks throughout government uh, that this is what the core needs, uh, this is what the core deserves. And we're going to make that case, uh, you know, and we won't give up, certainly. And, um, and you know, if we, if we are successful, then I think we will have a stronger core that's going to be, again, the public health asset that the nation needs. Thank you. Well, we are just about at the top of the hour. Um, thank you so much, Admiral Murthy, Admiral Hunter. Uh, on behalf of both of our organizations, our most profound appreciation to both of you for joining us this evening and for your tireless efforts on behalf of the public's health. For the Commissioned Officers Foundation, we look forward to seeing everyone at the 55th Annual PHS Scientific and Training Symposium next May in Glendale, Arizona. The ability for us to gather in person and share our commitment to the mission of the Commission Corps is something I know that we've all missed and something that will give us all cause to celebrate. More detailed information will, on the symposium will be available in the very near future on our website. Thank you all. Yeah. Admiral Solomon, if I could just add one last thing, which I'd be remiss yeah, not to sir. say, uh, both to you, Admiral Solomon, Commander Purdy, to all the, the organizers for today, to the leadership of COA. I just want to say a big thank you to all of you, because day in and day out, I know in ways that uh, many people may not hear about, you strive to support our officers. Uh, you know, our officers are active duty, our retired officers. Uh, many times when I traveled the country and met officers, they told me that it was because of COA that they had a community, uh, you know, where they were stationed, uh, that they had opportunities to come together and to build fellowship. So I want to thank you for that work because it's extraordinarily important. It's part of the glue that keeps our officers together. It's part of what sustains them. Uh, and a just deep appreciation to, uh, to you and to all of those at COA uh, for the service that you're providing. Thank you so much, Admiral. And we look forward to our partnership with you and all of your team going forward. So do Thank I. Thank you to everyone and good night.